You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Started breaking down and crying and saying, my girl got raped, Tara got raped. It's like, what? Because she's going to ask him clearly, why didn't you stop doing what you're doing to me at night? And why did you carry on? Why didn't you stop? And I told you to stop. So the phone call happened anyway, and she did ask him that. And his response was just some mumble, what happened fast, boom. I just grabbed him and I hit him, hit him with the bat with one hand. And even now, I look back on it and think, wow, a baseball bat, you know, like I held it, you know, like that. When that adrenaline kicks into you, you do things you don't even know you can do, but it's a proper baseball bat, full size. And I've grabbed him by one hand and I'm hitting him like that. And then I was just in my house thinking, fuck, man, this looks mad. There's white tent going up. There's a lot of police, fuck. This guy hasn't moved from there, so what the fuck's going on here? When I saw that murder board go up, I, I weren't lying to you, I was shitting my pants. I was thinking, fuck, you know, this is serious. You know what I mean? I've done a few things in my past, had a few fights and all them type of things, you know? When you're with your boys and you're out, then you're from where we're from, you know? But fuck, this is, yeah, it's reached the, the, the top of the top, this, isn't it? This is like 25 to life stuff, like, serial beast proper piece so it kind of gave me a satisfaction of what I had done as in like I, because did you doubt it I did doubt that, myself that maybe he was innocent yes I did 100% I doubted it. I, I, if but maybe yeah. could she be lying boom my own Today's guest, we've got Ophel. How are you, bro? Get your sofa. Yeah. It's London, <laughs> It's fucking roasting down here. Yeah, it's roasting, man. How are you, brother? I'm all right, brother. Thank you for having me on, man. Yeah, thanks for coming. We've been trying to get it happening for the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Fascinating story. I watched your story on Lad Bible. Life sentence for murdering the guy who raped your best friend's missus. Yeah. I don't condone violence, but I'll congratulate you on that because I think any man those sort of people need put down but it's a difficult one especially in that situation but you were only 19 when it happened it kind of took your life away yeah and yeah. this is the kind of stuff we'll get into but yeah. first and foremost how are you i'm all right i'm all right um happy to be out you know um obviously <laughs> i've done a few things since i got out i'm not exactly where i want to be yet but obviously it's a slow process rebuilding my life back in it yeah so one thing at a time you know before we touch on everything, I always go back to the start of my guest, get a better understanding about you, where mm -hmm. you grew up, how it all began. Mm -hmm. So basically, I grew up in North London, um, Wood Green to start off with, um, Tottenham uh, for the middle part, and then Frenzy Park. And then um, at 19 years old, I was gone, gone, life sentence. How about you at school? I was all right, you know. Um, <laughs> but saying that I have to be honest with you like the teachers always, always used to say look this boy this guy he's brilliant with classwork academically he's good but outside the class it's, it seems like a problem but what it was with me is just that like, I didn't let people take advantage of me or try and bully me and stuff like that because I went to um, a school called EBD school like emotional behavioural difficulties yeah and um it wasn't part of the mainstream school system. So it was set up by the local government, you know, for kids who had been um, kicked out of in uh, maybe primary school and stuff like that for their behavior problems. And maybe some kids with some special needs and stuff that were maybe in the care system, they will all go to this school. So at the age of like 13, 14, they transitioned me from that EBD school back into a mainstream school. So I was there from a, from that age up until 16. But uh, <laughs> it's it's strange because uh, I wanted to finish and I wanted to be successful. And but like the teacher said, outside of the classroom, it seems like problems were happening for me, be, happening for me because people were challenging me. You know, like I was from Wood Green, and then I'm in like a school called Highgate Wood. So that's Hornsey, and then like you had Hornsey people that go there, Frenzy Park people, and people from that area. And I'm from the Yavi area, so. 
a strange face to certain boys. They were like, oh, who's this? And I'm a confident boy. I always hold my head high, you know? Yeah. I don't look down from anybody, you know, like from a crowd of people or anything like that. And I didn't like that. So they tried to bully me a little bit and it just didn't work. So um, <laughs> I ended up getting into some problems with these boys, you know, boys will be boys, we have a little, yeah, settlers and, you know, straighteners and stuff like that. And that was the end of my uh, schooling at 16. But I'd done my pre mocks So I was supposed to be coming up for the GCSEs, but I missed that on the GCSEs. Mm -hmm. And after that, with most people um, from where I'm from, and I think other areas as well, I've heard of these places called units. So they would send you to these places to finish up maybe your NRA. I don't know if certain people know what NRA is, it's National Record of Achievement. So like when I was, in squad, I don't know about you. Do you remember your NRA? Or did they give you something yeah, else? Nah, nah. <laughs> GCEs, it was, I think I didn't even set me. GCSEs, okay. I thought I was going to be a football player. Yeah, I but um, them off. I got a chance, you know, to do a few a few things after I got kicked out, like um, computer skills and, um, you know, like finish up my maths and English and make sure I've got the best maths and English and stuff like that. And just ready me for, you know, employment and stuff like that at 16, innit? So after that, yeah, I went and got a... Um, a, a job working in a factory for secure record, like it was slave labor, man, just loading up them them trailers with parcels and stuff like that for for silly, stupid, cheap money. You know what I mean? So yeah, and then shit yeah. happens. After yeah, that. but that was a job, man. Like for going out and trying. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's easy to take the easy way out and try and do the mm -hmm. bad stuff. Yeah. What, what about parents? My parents. My mum was always there, brought me up. Of, apart from when my mum put me in care, my dad weren't around never. Um, I've got a stepdad, that's my little sister's dad, and I've got two sisters, um, and I'm the only um, boy in my family, you know. Um, so, yeah, my little sister's dad was kind of around partially. You know, he kind of still is nowadays, but I always knew that's not my dad, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's my little sister's dad, yeah. Do you think that affects you growing up? Because everybody that I have on those kind of that father figure's missing. Yeah, I think it did have an effect on me. So being the boy in my family, you know, my mom and my two sisters, it made me the the little man, you get me, of the yeah. the big man of the family, understand? So anything manly, I'll probably put in that position from young, that responsibility of look after the females in your family mm -hmm. and have manners and respect for the females in it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I think it affected me like that and made me more, I think, defensive over my mom and my sisters and stuff like that. I remember my mom always tells people a story about when I was a little boy, about four or five or something like that, some some guy that used to borrow her all the time and, and come to her house drunk, knock the door one time and um, my mum opened the door to say him to go away, fuck off basically. And I pushed my mum out of the way and gone, leave my mummy alone, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm only a little thing, but mm -hmm. you know. You've so always they, had that protection yeah. instinct from a young age. Yeah. To protect the female. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's a good thing you have ingrained in you. Yeah, it is, it is. And if I go back to the schooling, I actually got kicked out of that school because <laughs> some boy, threatened to slap my little sister. So I went and challenged him and said, well, what's you going on? And then he went out and he thought he was tough. I had a fight with him, pushed him. He fell down in a thorn bush and the thorn bush lacerated, cut up his hair and his parents called the police. And I ended up in court for that. And they had me on like an ABH charge or something like that. And I was thinking, what? That's just a fight. You know what I mean? A simple fight with boys in school. And then, you know what I mean? I'm in court now, you know what I mean? And the judge is threatening me. Like, if you're back in front of me, next time bring your toothbrush. And that was Highgate Magistrates. Yeah, never forget that. So yeah, that's how my schooling ended. Me defending my little sister. Yeah. <laughs> what happened after the security court job? After that, that's when all the the madness starts. You know, because um, uh, I had a best friend at the time. He had his girlfriend. I had my girlfriend. We used to knock about with each other. You know, go places, party with each other go gym, you know, do normal things. You know what I mean? Young boys do at our age, you know? And um, yeah, so that secure car job just had me few and far between. And then I, I cut it out of my life because I thought this is just shit money. And then I wanted to go university and be a, a Formula One mechanic. So I was looking at all these prospectors and stuff like that and looking into getting a, a uni loan and stuff like that, you know? But I wasn't that proactive on it. You know, I was just, floating with it, you know, taking each day as it comes. But that was my intention. But around that time, I was just kind of unemployed, really. So, yeah, then my Cody comes to me one day and says, yo, bro, I want to talk to you. After a long while, I ain't seen him, you know? So, yeah, you know the rest from there, man. 
Yeah. So my life was kind of mad. It's like school, a little employment, and then away. Yeah. Missed a lot yeah. of your youth. Yeah. Yeah. Normal things I should have been doing, like normal kids, I didn't get a chance to do, you know? Yeah. So talk me through that night then when your best friend's missus gets raped. You just go and get the guy, attack him, kill him, and then your life changes from there. Yeah, it's mad because I, me and my boy, like I said, we knocked about most of the time together and then there would be periods of time I wouldn't see him, you know, like for a few days. They only be a few days, two or three maximum. They call me, you know, be like, well, and they'd be like, oh yeah, well, I've been doing this or I've been doing that. But yeah, what's up, boom. And then that's it, we carry on from there. But I didn't see him for this time for about two weeks. And I'm thinking, wow, where is this boy disappeared to, you know? Called him a few times, didn't answer his phone and then call me back. So, you know, you know, it's when you're, it's your boy, your right hand man, you're thinking, what's going on, innit? You got your suspicions, you know? So I'm thinking, I hope all the best for him, you know what I mean? I hope he's all right. And then out of the blue, he calls me one night and I'm at home with my girlfriend and he says, uh, yeah, I'm coming to your house in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, meet me downstairs. So I was like, all right, cool. Jumped up, got dressed, you know what I mean? Went downstairs, got in his car, and um, yeah, and then I could tell something weren't right with him, because when I was buzzing, like, wow, 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 go on, bro, long time no see. He was like, mm, yeah, like, not really bothered there. Come, we're gonna go up the road and talk. I was thinking, oh, this is a bit strange as well. Why are we going up the road to talk? Like, <laughs> we just usually sit outside my house in the car and talk, innit? So we've driven up the road to one estate, and um, yeah, he just he started breaking down and crying and saying, my girl got raped. Tara got raped. It's like, what? I couldn't, you know what I mean? Take it in fully, properly, because it's not every day. I hear that. I, it's the first time in my life I've actually heard that, you know what I mean? From somebody so close to me. You know what I mean? So I'm like, wow. What do you mean? So he, I said, how, how, what? Did some guy drag her off the road? What, what the fuck? What's going on, man? He's like, no, nah, well, me and Tara weren't talking for a little while and, you know what I mean? So just a bit quiet between me and her, but it's not like we broke up or nothing. But obviously, while we weren't talking, what she said to me is, um, she's gone round to one of her friends, uh, this guy, she knows a friend, and they're going around to his yard for a little drink up. She confided in him a little bit about relationships and stuff like that, because he's a bit older as well. He was giving her advice on oh, what to do about her boyfriend and how to patch things up and whatever. Yeah, so... Um, she went to his house for a drink. His brother was there, other people were there. And then that on one occasion and another occasion, they went, she went around to have a drink up in this social gathering in his house. But uh, on that second time around, or whatever time around it was, I don't know how many times she went to the house, honest with you. But I know she went there a few times and come back because they had that sort of friend relationship. She's saying that the guy was like, oh, can we talk about what your private business away from everybody else? You know what I mean? In the bedroom, because, you know what I mean? It's a private. Take your drink, come, let's go. She went off in the bedroom, he closed the door. Then he just jumped on her and demanded sex. And she was like, no, nah, get off of me, get off of me. You know, I've got a boyfriend. And he was like, I don't give a fuck about your boyfriend. I'm a bad man, I'm a gangster, I don't care. I'll tell him that I'm fucking you and stuff like that. And she just said, I was so scared. I just let him do what he wanted to do and just hope it would have been over quickly. But he raped me. And I was I'm like, fuck. So what if she told her mum or a pet or a police or anything like that? She's like, nah, she don't want to because she's scared to do that. And I, at the time, I didn't understand. I'm processing things fast in my head, like, what? Okay, cool, what's the next thing then? All right then, so what's happening? What are you doing about it? Well, you no, know, like, it was like, oh, well, she's got his number and what I plan to do is make her call him and say, look, come meet me somewhere later and then we just go and scare him off. And scare him off, all right, cool. That's the plan, yeah? All right, yeah, 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 maybe I might smash up his car. He said, oh, I might even break his knee or something like that, but this guy is gonna leave Tara alone from tonight. All right, cool. They said to me, look, you know, I got a bat in my car, in your flat, the boy downstairs who lives downstairs from you. You can go to his house and go back, you know, this one in there, you know what I mean? It's my neighbor, yeah, we know there's a bat downstairs in his house, so all right, cool. So I was like, all right, who is this guy? You know what I mean? Give me some more information. Who is he, where is he from and stuff like that. And it was very minimal, the information about where he was from, but he was local to the North London area and um, apparently he was calling himself a gangster to uh, Tara saying that he's got a lot of um, um, people underneath him that work for him and, you know, run up and down road for him and, you know, he's a powerful man. So 
all this stuff she was feeding into he was feeding into her head. She's just fed back to him and he's feeding it to me. So I'm like, okay, going off of this information, this guy sounds like, you know, like he's real confident. And you know, like the, the age of him sounds like he's about 30, 35, 36 or something like that. I'm thinking, okay, you can't really approach this too lightly because you know, he might be walking into a shit storm if this guy is really a gangster and a bad man, you know what I mean? And you could have anything with him, innit? Could have his gun, could have a sword, could have his mates, who, you know what I mean? Have tools or whatever. You know, so right, then we need to know what we're doing when we're getting there. So I'm going along with him to his ass. She's made the phone call to him to say, look, oh, um, me and my boyfriend are talking again. Um, just wondered if you come come see me later and we can have a chat. But um, a key moment of that conversation was with my co-defendant before, obviously, the phone call. He said to her, look, ask him why he done that to you that night and ask him why didn't he stop? Because I want to hear what he's got to say. And that for me was very important, James, because I'm thinking to myself, this guy has to answer now. And I'm going to know whether it's something dodgy going on or, you know, it's real. Because she's going to ask him clearly, why didn't you stop doing what you are doing to me that night? And why did you carry on? Why didn't you stop when I told you to stop? So the phone call happened anyway, and she did ask him that. And his response was just some mumble that I could never, ever, ever for my life understand. But it wasn't a clear communication of what are you talking about? You know, because he understood everything else she was saying. It's clear English she's speaking, you understand? Mm -hmm. And he understood it. But when it come to her asking him that question, he seemed to mumble and didn't have no... No answer. Oh, me, 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 no, no, me. So I was like, what? And I didn't say that, obviously, but in my head I'm thinking, what? Because obviously we're, we're being quiet, isn't it? She's on the phone and we're airing in. Anyway, so that was, all right, cool. This guy's guilty, isn't it? We're going to go there, approach him, and see what happens. So driven back down to my ass. And uh, the plan was, there's a bus stop outside my ass. For him to pull up at that bus stop, we wait in the phone box just a few yards up. And then when he pulls up, we come out and that's it, approach him and say, yo, wait, you wrong and blah, blah, blah. It's all good in theory though, isn't it? But in reality, we know things don't go like that. So when we've actually come out the phone box, when he's come to get her, he's seen us coming. He's turned around and he's grabbed Tara straight away, you know, like to shield him. So automatically we're about two, three steps away from him now, that close, you know, and it's all happening fast, boom. I just grabbed him and I hit him, hit him with the bat with one hand. And even now I look back on it and think, wow, a baseball bat, you know, like I held it, you know, like that, when that adrenaline kicks into you, you do things you don't even know you can do, but it's, it's a proper baseball bat, full size. And I've grabbed him by one hand and I'm hitting him like that. And my Cody's doing the same thing on the other side of him just to get him off of Tara. You know, she's screaming, she managed to get off. Get out, get out of his grip. She'd run back into probably my flats. Well, I know she didn't know anyway, but I'm not knowing at the time. Because now, this man's trying to get the bat off me. He's trying to come for me. But I'm not having that. I'm taking back steps and I'm swinging and I'm swinging and I'm swinging this bat. Just keep hitting him around his head area, neck area, you know? Just keep hitting him until he just dropped on the floor on one knee and then I ran off. But while I was hitting him, I could just hear smash, 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 smash. Glass white, but is it until after I realized my co defendant was just smashing up the car, you know? And then that's it. I was like, Come, let's go. Run off up the road, dropped the bats in some bins in some estate, <sighs> went up the road, come back down, went into my flat, and watched the whole thing out of my window basically from my flat because it overlooked the whole thing on the road. And then I was just in my house thinking, Fuck, man, this looks mad. This white tent going up. That's a lot of police, fuck. This guy hasn't moved from there, so what the fuck's going on there, man? Like, you know, and they were there for hours and hours and hours and hours. I was just thinking, fuck, you know, man. This is looking serious, man. You know what I mean, this is more than just approach the fucking rapist guy and give him what, you know what I mean? A scare off him, you know what I mean? Or hit him in his fucking legs. This is looking fucking serious, and I'm thinking, fuck. It feels like this is all on me, because I know, you know what I mean, what was going on. He's trying to get the butter for me, and I've probably done most of the hitting, but I don't, what the fuck? There's loads of shit going on. So, believe it or not, I got down on my knees and I prayed. 
My girlfriend's going, what's going on? What's going on? What, what's going on? I'm trying my best not to tell her what the fuck happened. I've made up some tired excuse about, oh, we had a bit of a scrap with some boys down the road in Rowan's Bowen Valley and that was about it. Nothing to worry about. But she's asking questions. Why is Tara like that in the front room? She came in and she was in a bit of a, but I'm trying to avoid her. You know what I mean? So my Cody's gone in there with her as well and he's sitting down and he's trying to comfort her and whatnot. And then my girl's just like, why are you praying for? I'm saying, just leave me alone for a second. I've got to do what I've got to do. And you know, it's just, it was mad hectic. And them times my mum worked in a bus garage as a um, a cleaning supervisor in East London. And um, she always used to come back like late about like maybe one, two o'clock in the morning. So then I start looking at my thing, my watch, and you fucking hell, mum's coming back soon. This is mad, because she's going to know, what's all these people doing in my ass? It's mm. after hours, and, you know, just be a shit going from my head, and I keep popping out my front door to look out the window and come back, and fucking hell, man. And it just went on for hours and hours and hours, and then the tent just stayed there, and then the ambulance left. And I was thinking, fuck, what's going to happen to that man? It was until days, days later, I have seen a murder board go up, Crime Stoppers murder board and posters go up asking, do you know this man? Um, he goes under two aliases and uh, he was murdered. Um, any information, you know what I mean? They give the thousand pound reward or whatever it is. And I'm thinking, fuck, she's fucking serious here, yeah, man. So obviously me and my Cody get on the phone, talking, telling him about this, you know what I mean? And he's like, well, fuck, we can't be together for a while, mate. You know what I mean? You stay over there, I'll stay over there, innit? You lived about half an hour away from me. I was like, all right, cool. That was it, I just carried on as normal, man. I tried to anyway, but it was just on my conscience. You know what I mean? This fucking thing, serious murder, what the fuck? Um, I didn't know what to do, you know what I mean? It's not like I've done something like that before and I'm professional at it, you know what I mean? And I had to, yeah. It's right on my doorstep as well, James. I'm thinking, fuck, you know? And everyone's asking questions and that, asking questions, and I'm just acting like I don't know. I'm acting like everyone else, like, what? Yeah, yeah, that's strange, yeah, what the fuck? You know what I mean? And, um, <laughs> About a week after that, across the road from my house, I could see the police watching me from above the shops. And I told my co-defendant, he thought I was being paranoid. I said, nah, man, they're watching us. I see the curtain move, I saw a camera, they're watching us. But I, in my head, I'm thinking, why haven't they come for me yet? If you're watching me, why haven't they come for me? Well, what's, what the fuck's going on, man? What the fuck, you know what I mean? Like, put the bats in the bin up the road. Did they find the bats? Did they find the prints? What the fuck? At a certain stage, James, I was thinking, fuck it. If you lot are coming for me, just hurry up and come. Stop torturing me, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thinking, what? Are you coming or not? You know? And they did a door to door. They come even to my door and asked me where I was that night and gave them my alibi. I said I was up the road. You know what I mean? I've come back. I've seen the tent and all that. And they just were normal. All right, thank you very much. I went on their way and I was thinking, fuck. You know, do they know that I'm blatantly lying yeah. or did they, why are they longing this out for? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until after the interview, you know, police interview and that I've realized and they've come out of it that there was um, some crack addicts from around our area who saw us on that night. He was in the opposite phone box, tried to come into our phone box and um, make a phone call. And I told him to fuck off. I said, look, move. And then he was like, no, I need to, I need to make a phone call, it's important. It's important, I have to call my baby mother about something tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, nah, nah, nah go in there with a phone box. He was like, nah, it doesn't take card. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, sorry, it takes card, it doesn't take coin. I need to use this one, he, this cunt would not go away. But I was like, fuck you. And I, I looked him in his face and I was like, move. And then he looked down in, in a phone box, this brave crackhead, and he saw the baseball bats. And he said to me, my Cody, be careful you two don't get a life sentence, you know? And I was like, fuck, you know, when he said that that night, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So obviously in the interview, you know what I mean? When it's come out that this yeah. person, this, they've got a witness that tried to use the phone box, obviously I know, oh, it's him. Fuck, you know. So when did you find out he was murdered? He was dead? Um, When that, murder poster went up and the, the yellow murder boards went up right outside my ass. I was thinking, fuck, this guy's actually fucking dead. I think it was about six days later or something like that. I was thinking, wow. You know what I mean? It hit me, I was like, wow. You know, cause in my head, I'm still trying to balance up whether he absolutely 100% was a wrong one, but in my heart, 
I've, it's something he said he was because of the actions as well. And why would he see two people coming towards you and grab the girl you're looking to pick up? Mm-hmm. You know? So, you know, and then other things come out after as well, man, about him. But um, when I saw that murder board go up, I, I weren't lying to you. I was shit in my pants. I was thinking, fuck, you know, this is serious. You know I mean, I've done a few things in my past. I had a few fights and all them type of things, you know? When you're with your boys and you're out there and you're from where we're from, you know? But fuck, this is, yeah, it's reached the, the, the top of the top, this, isn't it? Mm. This is like 25 to life stuff. Like, it's ain't a joke, you know? At 19, no, that. Like- how long did it take for them to catch you? About a month and a half. Could be two months. A month and a half, two months. Yeah, about eight weeks together. They did, they, they did a long old investigation. Did you think about hold, giving yourself up or did you just thought, fuck it, I'm on the right target? You know what? Certain times I thought about it. I thought, all we got to do, me, my Cody, and tell her, is go to the police and tell them the story and be like, listen, this is what happened. I'm thinking in my head, this is rape. And obviously we just went out to approach him mm-hmm. and say, look, stay away from her. Maybe our intention was to maybe to be a bit aggressive, you know? Mm-hmm. Maybe, I don't know, man, smash him in his kneecap or something like that. You know, I don't know how far we would have went, but we weren't looking to go as far as murder. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Did you ever question it? Obviously with the, the girl Tara as well. Did you need that confirmation when you, yes. when you phoned him? Because listen, not all girls are bad, but because of maybe the, the guy, the relationship breaks up, the guy finds out maybe slept with somebody and the girl shouts rape. Exactly. Did you ever question that in your mind that maybe the guy never done it? Is that why you needed that phone call? Yeah, to confirm that? the confirmation, yeah. yeah. Because it, to me, it seemed a bit, I've never heard of nothing like that, but obviously being that young, obviously at the time my head wasn't into investigating cases like that, mm-hmm. what type of rape cases there are where, you know what I mean? There's rape cases where a man and a woman have been married for years, 10, 20, 30 years, but as soon as that woman, they've got 20, I'm sorry, not 20 kids, they've got kids together and stuff, but mm-hmm. if a woman says no to a man, her boyfriend, whoever it is, no means no, innit? If any mm-hmm. human says no to somebody else touching them sexually, no means no. Yeah. So from you past that, it's rape, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's what it is, isn't it? Somebody doesn't want somebody else to touch them like that or enter into them as a woman, you know? Mm-hmm. That's rape, isn't it? So regardless whether or not she was giving him consensual, maybe at the beginning, and then changed her mind, which some people think, mm-hmm. and because obviously everyone's got their conspiracy about it, their, their conspiracy theory about it, you know? And the only people who really, really will ever know the 100% truth is Tara and the deceased man, you know, but obviously other things come out in the trial and other things before even the trial come out about him and his character and his behavior that added more evidence to him being a nuts, a, a paedophile rapist. Yeah. How was it going through the trial once you get caught in remand? Like, are you thinking I'm fuck 19 year old black kid from London, like criminal record from the past? You've got all those stories you're trying to help save your friends, missus. Mm. And you, are you thinking they ain't going to believe me here? You know what? I'm thinking that. I'm thinking I'm fucked. I'm fucked. And also the race thing come into it as well. But our barristers were careful with how they selected the jury. There was obviously a Somalian man in there, an Asian woman in there. I tried to put a bit of colour in there, but I still felt like I'm in the old Bailey as a black boy. Fuck. You know what I mean? This is hard, you know? And, um, but apart from the racist thing about it, it was the pressure of, they're bringing up my old little things. I had like my little school fight. Remember I told you about that? Mm. They brought that up. Um, anything that I'd done bad in the past, or maybe, you know, um, I got an ABH and a GBH, both school fights, but they brought them up mm. and I and tried to make me look like a bad person, you know? And um, I don't know, they just brought up, I don't know, maybe like, stuff about uh, my upbringing, me being in care and stuff like that. And and it's, 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 it's fucked up how the barristers word things, you know, they'll, they'll show the jury, look, this is his character, but this is where the bad part of his character is, you know, mm-hmm. and then they'll focus in on that. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, yeah. they're, they're the best at um, giving the fucking twisted vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Was that ever, was it murder you were charged with? Yeah, it was murder. Um, 
My mm. barrister tried to get me a plea for manslaughter, a plea bargain, but the prosecution said they will only take me and my co-defendant as a package on the manslaughter, not one of us asking for manslaughter and the other one's still on the murder. Mm -hmm. So that was a hard part in the trial as well, because I'm saying to my co-defendant, let's just go for the manslaughter. But he's saying, listen, I'm not taking nothing. I'm going home. I, as far as I'm concerned, he was saying, I didn't do nothing much. I hit him a couple of times around his shoulder and his neck to get him off a of Tara. Then I smashed his car. So I'm standing in there thinking, fucking hell, yeah. It probably is fucking all me then, isn't it? All right, then whatever. Do what you got to do, mate. Yeah, try and get yourself home. I'll try and get myself home. So it's almost like a cutthroat trial between me and my co-defendant. But it's the barristers that are doing the cutthroat, and you see, it's not mm -hmm. us doing it in the trial. It's the way the barristers are presenting our case as individuals. And in my case, my barrister was saying, look, this young man was at home with his missus, ain't seen his friend for a while. And out of nowhere, his friend calls him, asks him to assist him for a serious situation. I give him that support. It goes a bit too far. And now I'm in the thick of it. I didn't got an intention to murder my man, you know? I'm just helping out my friend and his girlfriend, you know? So my co-defendant's barrister, he's putting across the his, his, his case as, well, yeah, it is a crime of um, a, a, a passion, if you want to put it like that. And he was led by his emotions. So there might be some um, diminished responsibility in there. Yeah, and uh, these are the things that he done on the night. So how this man ended up dying, you just have to use your head members of the jury and it isn't hard to work out. What are the witnesses saying? It's 14 witnesses. It was, Stroud Green Road, big high road on um, Frenzy Park. What are the witnesses saying? Seven of the witnesses are saying that the shorter one they're referring to me, and McCody's a taller one. The shorter one done most of the hitting and the taller one was smashing up the car. It's seven of them are saying total madness. They're saying that the guy was on the floor, lying down flat, you know, and I'm hitting him while he's lying on the floor. And the guy was never even lying on the floor, you know. And some of them are saying other things like the the taller one done more hitting and the shorter one, they don't know what the shorter one was doing and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So it was um, it was hard watching the barristers go at it. And I wasn't in a position, you know, when you're in court, you can't just shout things out. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, make the process play itself out how it's, it plays out. And then you've got the judge's recommendations and then, Another hard thing about the trial was Tara wasn't in our trial. She got a plea bargain for conspiracy to assault. So initially it was all on the murder, tra murder charge. Then Tara went down from the murder down to manslaughter. They went put her and then they realized that she couldn't, they couldn't even pin manslaughter on her because she never had no physical, you know, interaction with the guy for the assault happening on him. So they gave her conspiracy to assault because she, possibly had a clue that there might be something kicking off, but mm -hmm. she didn't know it was going to go that far. You know, so they took her out of our trial and she was next door in another courtroom. So the, so the jury are getting told this story about a girl who got raped, but there's no girl in the, in the physical form. But the judge is directing them to believe that we were told this story, this girl is real, but she won't be part of this trial. But they're still sending notes to the judge going, are we going to hear from the girl? That's how much I think it was important for her to say what happened to her and that maybe could have, you know, changed the decision with the jury, maybe. Yeah. Cause, How cause, was it going against your friend, the the guy who's asked you to be there? So you're basically there to help him, but yet he's a kind of turned against each other. Yeah, it was hard. It was hard, man. Cause I was thinking, like I said, is it my fault? But then I'm thinking, it's not my fault. You called me out of my ass. So anything that happens after that, it is kind of your responsibility, isn't it? Like, well, you called me out of my ass. I come to support you. I've hit the guy to get him off a of Tara. Then he's trying to come for me and grab the battle for me. I just have to be normal now and defend myself. If that's gone too far, it's still all on you, mate. You know what I mean? This is your show. You brought me along to your show. So what's going on now? But it's just like he wanted to slide off on his own avenue. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And just, but it ended up, look, they, they said, all right, none of you are taking the manslaughter. If both of you ain't taking the manslaughter, then that's it. You're both on the, on the murder. And that's it, we're both convicted for murder. How was it then when you get convicted? When you got the was the evidence all against you anyway that did you know that you were going to get a guilty? 
kind of, yeah, because they found the baseball bats, the prints were on them. Um, they, they had witness statements, the ID parade, they picked us out. And um, I had that guy from the night, the crackhead guy, I went to use the phone mm-hmm. box, you know, his evidence was powerful for them, you know, because he, mm-hmm. he saw the bats, he saw us, you know, plain faces. And um, so it was hard. I was just thinking in my head, oh, I don't get 25, you know, because at that time, I thought, all I know about life sentence is 25 to life, 25 to life. You know, like you hear it on the TV and stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. So I was just thinking, oh, I don't get 25. Anything under that, I could probably deal with it. Did you ever get to say why you done it? Did that ever get used in court? Um, my statement, yeah, got used. The statement I, my barrister put across for me got used in court, yeah. Yeah, I said my piece, but obviously it wasn't good enough. What was his previous convictions, the guy you killed? Right. Um, I'm not sure of that because he was a, a legal um, person in the country, didn't have a passport to be in this country. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> but basically they want the character reference from him for that reason, from this man's family, yeah, his closest family members. Um, so, and they wanted somebody as well who could give evidence that they saw Tara come around to his house a few times, yeah? So he wanted to know whether this story that she was telling us was true. So who better than his younger brother that was there on the occasions that Tara went round to the house to have this social gathering. He was there with his friends, apparently. He was mm-hmm. giving, he gave evidence. He was a young boy, probably about 16 at the time, I would say. Well-spoken, you know, well-presented. Excuse me. Yeah, he presented himself very well. And... Um, I thought he was going to paint a glowing picture of his brother. My brother's a great guy. You know what I mean? He's this, he's that. It's a shame he died. But I was shocked, James, because he actually, when he started speaking and telling the character of his brother, he said that his brother used to go to fun. But first of all, he said, yeah, I remember Tara. She did come round to the house a couple of times. And I do remember the time they went in the bedroom or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, then he was asked what kind of character he was, was he with women in the public? And he said, oh, well, sometimes well, most of the time he used to try and go to fun fairs and things like that to pick up young, really young girls. And I told him, stop doing that. Stop doing that. That's not good. And But he wouldn't listen to me. And he said, oh, he's got a lot of baby mothers as well. Yeah. Um, for, who's don't, for people who don't know what baby mothers are, that's like, he's got a lot of women pregnant basically mm-hmm. all over the place and, you know, stuff like that. So I was surprised to hear that. And also with that, when my girlfriend saw the murder would go up in the street, she said to me that she knows that guy's face because he tried to rape her in a hairdresser's about a year before she met me. So I'm putting all of these things together in my head. What my girlfriend said, what his boyfriend, what his, what his brother said. <laughs> to edit that piece out, I don't know about that. Um, I think this guy, without me knowing him, even having a word of him, the people that are most close to him are all saying the same thing that he's been close to. He got kind of close to my ex-girlfriend I was with at the time and tried to rape her. And she didn't have no reason to say that about him, you know? Um, and his own brother, his own flesh and blood telling the old Bailey that he's trying to pick up young girls, underage girls from fun fairs. Yeah, so he was a serial beast. He's serial beast. Proper beast. So it kind of gave me a satisfaction of what I had done as in like... I- because did you doubt it? I did doubt myself. That maybe he was innocent? Yes, I did. 100%. I doubted it. I, if, but maybe. Yeah. Could she be lying? But with what my ex-girlfriend said, and then what his brother said. And it's sad to say that, but you've still got to look at it at all angles. Of course. Do you of know course. You're I'm lying, a real person. Yeah, you're lying in a cell and you're thinking, fuck, what if I was wrong? Exactly. But when you hear that, then you, you go, do you know what? I've done the right thing. He was a yeah. serial beast. He's trying to pick up young girls. He's raping women then it gives you a little bit of peace yeah. of mind. You never want to take a man's life, yeah. let, let's be honest, because yeah. that will live, you, live with you for the, to the day you die. Like, exactly. Is that Did that give you a bit of satisfaction then if you did get a big sentence, yeah. you could handle it a bit better? Yeah, definitely. I can hold my head up, you know, and mm-hmm. be like, well, I know what I did, you know what I mean, was the right thing in the eyes of God and the eyes of society who have got their right mind on. Because some people in society ain't got their right mind on. Some people in society will be like, well, he can... Do what you can rape when he's not, no one's got the right to take his life and stuff like that. And I'm not saying I had the right to take his life, but that's just how the situation unfolded. And that's how it happened. That was his destiny. That was his fate. Everybody knows the old saying, live by the sword, you die, die by, by the sword. sword. Yeah? yeah. We know it. You live by the gun, you die by the gun. So, you know what I mean? 
you live by fuckery and evilness, you got, you're probably going to die a horrible way. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to kill a man? Um, it's a strange feeling. It's a strange feeling. You wonder if you, 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 you've got the curse of a killer, you know? If you're a godly man like myself, you know what I mean? And believe in karma and stuff like that. You know what I mean? In the Bible, Old Testament and stuff like that. Thy shall not this, thy shall not that. You start thinking, oh, hold on a minute. Have I broken one of them? But hold on a minute. I'm on the right side of the line here. I've stopped a monster attacking women. So do these rules and karmas and that apply to me? So is it, am I, is it gonna come back for me? What, did I do the wrong thing? So if I'm on the right side of the line, am I all right? So it plays on my conscience. It did play on my conscience for a long while, but nowadays I'm all right. Mm. You know? Um, did you know what sentence you were getting when you got a guilty? No, my barrister said to me, it could be anything up to 20. He said some in these situations, they can give you natural life if they want to, but it all depends on the judge. Depends on what he's had for breakfast. Did he have breakfast, you know? Did he get his leg over last night? You know, like, what mood is he in? And people kept saying that throughout the whole of my trial. Oh, it depends what mood the judge is in, depends what mood the judge is in. I'm thinking, fuck the judge. It depends what the fucking jury is coming up with and what my barrister's doing, innit? The judge can only go off of the law, innit? Quote the Archibald and give direction. And then obviously go by the Archibald again and look at the maximum he can give and the minimum he can give and find somewhere fair in between, given individual circumstances, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah. What was that feeling when you got your 12? Was that a relief? Or were you thinking, fuck man, I'm going to be locked in a cage for 12 years? It was double-edged, you know? It was relief and it was fuck, you know? But it was relief, it wasn't the 25 and it wasn't the natural life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it was fucking out. What was it like your first night in prison? It was shit, man. You know what I mean? I thought, right, this is the start of fucking many years to come, man. Like, what the fuck, man? How am I going to deal with this tomorrow? Like, when I come out the cell, like... Because at the time, I didn't really know who that guy was that intimately, you know, and being from my area, I'm thinking, okay, this is Joe you're going to. Everyone knows everyone. It's a small world fucking tiny country in it. You know what I mean? The jail system's even fucking smaller. And if you are who you say you are, Mr. Bad Man, this, that, and the other, you probably got a couple of bad man friends and stuff like that. And then bad people are in these places, innit? Prison. So fucking hell, mate. I gotta be ready for any cunt that wants to come step to me. And I'm gonna be defending, I killed a rapist, mate. So if you wanna fucking come and fuck with me for your rapist, mate, then I'm gonna fucking end up dying in there, innit? So I'm coming out of my soul with that mentality. Fuck, someone might try and come for me, mm -hmm. but I've got to be ready to take their life before they're trying to take mine. See, when you're inside there, though, how hard is it to try and not go full-scale criminal, full-scale bad man, to then try and work your way through your sentence and come out and try and then make something of your life? Did you think in there that you, like you said, walking out that mentality, I ain't fucking around, man. I'll, I'll mm. kill again if somebody wants to put it on me. Like, did yeah. you have to begin with that mentality or did you try and work on yourself straight away? You know what? I had that mentality for a, a, a good, I don't know, man, first half of my sentence. You know what I mean? And towards the end, when they start dangling D, uh, C cat and D cat carrots in front of you, you know what I mean? They call it the system, innit? You need to switch off your system head and then start switching back on your road head and getting mm -hmm. ready to go home, your D-cat head, innit? You know what I mean? So when you get a taste of D-cat, now you realise, yeah, I've got to switch off my system head. There's no one in there that's trying to, you know what I mean, stab man up or uh, or fight with man. Everyone's trying to go home. Everyone's trying to go to work from D-cat, you know what I mean? You get the odd idiot, you know what I mean? He's in there for a little fucking... TDA or something like that, you know what I mean? Or mm. little white collar crime, you know what I mean? Where you can afford to be a dickhead and try and give you a bit of lip, but you know who those guys are. They're just trying to, you know what I mean? Bait you to see you get kicked out with them, you know what I mean? So mm. DCAT's a horrible place at the same time. How were you treated in prison after your crime? I was all right. Did you get I respect right. for that? Yeah, I did. I got respect for everyone from the governors to the, I mean, screws, you know what I mean? All the man them, 
Yeah, I've got respect for that still, but obviously prison is prison. You've got always a dickhead somewhere that wants to try it with you, you know what test I mean? You. Try and, yeah, test you out, you know what I mean? Try and see if they can get two stripes off you or something like mm -hmm. that. But, you know what I mean? I've, I've had my fair few scrapes in there, you know what I mean, with people. But yeah, it's, it's, it's the fucking belly of the beast, man. How many prisons were you in? Fuck, a lot, man. Probably about 15 or 17 altogether, I think, yeah. Why so many? Because they, they started me off in Feltham and I had to get started up and then go to, oh, sorry, after Ellsbury, I got started up and went Gartree and then from Gartree, that's still B cat. So then you're trying to get to C cats, but what it is now, I'm from London and they've sent me way out of the area to these country far jails. So it's far for my family to see me. So while they're sending me through these system jails, I'm always trying to get back closer to London to see my family. So I'm doing sideways moves and then they want me to do a course or something like that. And the jail that I'm in don't do the course. So I've got to go somewhere else. And then you hear about somewhere like a TC, like um, um, Dovegate, half of the prison is like normal. And the other half prison, they do a therapeutic community. So when you're halfway kind of through your, your sentence, like my sentence was, I was thinking, all right, I need to get a, from a C cat to get an easy D cat. What can I do to avoid all of these courses that are probably going to be chucked at me? You hear about TC. If you do a period on a therapeutic community, the psychologists and the staff on there are qualified to write you up a good report, put it in front of the parole board, you know, and get a fast track to a DCAT, you know? So you're trying all of these little tricks in the system to try and, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Get to a DCAT as fast as you can, as fast as you can, man. So there comes a stage in my sense, there become a stage in my sentence where I had to switch off that aggressive, you know, that defensiveness almost, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That defense, every day I come out, I'm on defense mode. You know what I mean? I'm not letting yeah. no one try and step on my toe or no one try and take advantage of me. You know what I mean? I have to make people in there know the same time. Yeah, I'm a lifer, but this is my house as well. You know, I do live here and I'm ready to stay here forever, you know? So don't take the piss. What did your code you get? You got one more year than me. Did you? Yeah, you got one more year than me. How's the relationship now? I don't speak to him. I don't speak to him. I'm not allowed to speak to him. It's part of the license condition. Do you hold a grudge against that? Um, Asking you to help him? You know what? Or is that your mentality? I don't, you know, I don't. But what I do kind of still dislike is the decision, the decision not to take the manslaughter. Could have been out years ago. You know what I mean? It's almost like, even the, I, felt, I felt like the whole court wanted us both to take the manslaughter, you know, because they weren't left. Because I think in the trial, if I'm right, I am right as well, you know, they, the jury wanted to know, can they give one of us one, they said, can we give one manslaughter and one murder and stuff like that? And I was like, yes. You know what I mean? It's working, but it's half working, isn't it? Why are they asking, can we give one, the other one? What? You know what I mean? So they probably would have, man, because they knew. We didn't go out there with intention to murder, but obviously because of the actions and the violence and the injuries, yeah, it's a manslaughter, isn't it? So there's no life license hanging over your head. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You've got to go through tons of shit. You know what I mean? You can get out after what, four or five years or something like that. You know what I mean? Being a D cat. Fucking after what, two years, three years or something like that. How was it being away from your mum and your sisters as a protector that you are and always uh, been there for? That them? was hard. That was hard. That was hard. You know what? <sighs> One of the hardest things altogether I had to do is that staying away from my family <laughs> and um, the distance as well. They had to travel to come and see me. And sometimes they couldn't always come and see me because, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, that was hard, man. There come periods of time where I wouldn't even want to see them. They'd ask, why come you not send me no VOs? I'm all right, I'm all right, I would say. But I was lying, man, because I just didn't want them to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Travel that far and have to go away all the time, and you know what I mean? And come and see the conditions I'm living in, and you know what I mean? And seeing their emotional, you know what I mean? Breakdown and stuff like that. I, I didn't want to deal with that, man. So I was just like, all right, cool, man. I just always phoned them. Phone calls, phone calls, phone calls, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. What was yeah. it like getting out for the first time after 12 years? Um, It was good. It was good. It was good. It was so good, man. Um, I was buzzing. I was all over the place partying as much as I could. Um, yeah. yeah. It was good, man. It was good. It was good. Yeah. What do you think looking back at it now? Well, it was a long time ago now. What was it? How many years? 2003? It's probably about 18, 
That's 2000, yeah, 2003. Yeah, 20 years ago. 20, 20 years ago, yeah. How does it feel talking about that? Does it bring back a lot of emotion? Yeah, it does, you know. It does, and especially the way you've asked these questions as well. It's different from what everyone else has asked me. So, yeah, it's it does bring it back up, man. And it, like I said to you, man, there's probably certain things I would say to you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Differently, you know what I mean? Over a drink, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, bro, fucking hell, it's, it's mad. It's mad, man. But um, I don't know, still, I always live in my head thinking, fucking hell, man. You know what I mean? Like, it was a, it was a, it was a major changing point in my life. You know what I mean? And why did it have to happen to me? You know what I mean? But if one's got their destiny in it, if one's got their path, they have to live in it. And I reckon that was part of my path, man. Maybe you know what I mean to help somebody and to make a, that sacrifice. You know what I mean to help somebody. You know what I mean and give up a big chunk of my life. You know what I mean? But does it replay in your mind? Or nightmares or think about that? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does sometimes, you know, flashbacks and stuff like that. and Screams or anything? Nah, not screams or anything like that. It was, it was more just that, that the violence that was happening that night. And, you know, when people say things and when I hear certain lyrics in certain songs or I see certain things, I'm like, fuck it, no too close to what, you know what I mean? I went through and stuff like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when people make up f f songs and say stuff about baseball bats and this and that, I'm thinking, fuck, you know, man, like, it's mad. Like, sometimes like, I don't even want to hear that. Like, yeah. It's mad, you know what I mean? Did you ever go and see a therapist or anything? Or a counselor? No, nah, nah, you know what? None of that was ever offered to me after, you know? You know, like, that's it, you're done your sentence, get out, mm -hmm. and that's it. You just got to go and sign into probation mm -hmm. and they're fucking dribbling to send you back to jail. <laughs> if you put one foot wrong, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Recall your ass quicker than they can say fucking recall. But yeah, man, it's, it's yeah, it's mad. It's How mad. do you move on with your life now after doing a lifer? Do you think you can repair it or do you still struggle? Um, I believe I can make a success of my life, you know, because I spent so much time in there on my music writing my music, writing my lyrics. So I rap, you know, and you can find all my music on, oh, just type in my name, O-F-I-L-L -L, on all the platforms or whatever. You can see, you know what I mean? My stuff and what I've been doing. And, you know, I've I've done a, a project lately um, with um, one of the members of the Fanatics. His name's Masterpiece, you know? He's done um, a lot of uh, songs for people who are known in the industry and I'm just blessed that I got an opportunity, you know what I mean, to work with him and my other other friends that are in the music industry, you know, and um, yeah, man, I'm just pushing, pushing and pushing until I make a success of myself, whether it's, I don't know, through the music or through, you know what I mean, laboring or doing something else or I have to go back to university, you know what I mean, and start up a new course or, or, or career or a trade or something like that. I'm just that person that's determined to win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to uh, fail. Because you're working now, eh? Yeah, yeah, scaffolding. How hard was it to get a job? Fucking hell. It was hard, man. It was hard. I was on the Universal Credit for a long time, you know what I mean? And they kept trying to set me up with interviews and stuff like that, but they'd, no one get back to me. You know, mm -hmm. so the only places that would have somebody like me is construction sites. But then you're going through an agency and stuff like that. You know what I mean? And getting a UTR number and the 20% tax and all this mad type of stuff that, you know what I mean? I didn't even know about, you know what I mean? So then you realize, wow, what the agency's taking and what I'm working for, you know what I mean? It's better I work straight for the company and stuff like that. So I'm trying to still find my way through to that, you know, like, but scaffolding's a bit more my thing because <laughs> you can, you know what I mean, earn certain cards or get certain cards and then, uh, you know, your money goes up. Are you still out in license or is that over? Yeah, no, my license is for life, but apparently my probation worker is saying that um, they have reviews and obviously on these reviews, they can um, opt to suspend your license, you know, if you're doing well and stuff like that, which I am right now, so yeah. How hard is that, knowing if you put a foot wrong, you could be doing a lifer again? It's fucked, man. It's fucked. It's like, I'm under threat. I feel like, you know what I mean? They're just waiting for me to put a foot wrong sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, what if, what if I miss an appointment or something like that? Or, hmm. you know what I mean? Like, how come you lot can just chuck me back in there? So 
so easy and then it's just gonna take so long to get back out. It's it's out of order, man. I don't I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I can't wait to get rid of this 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 fucking um thing hanging over my head, man. It's like a dark cloud. Yeah, does that make you kinda hope not hold back in life but just be very sceptical who you speak to, what you do. Yeah. Because yeah. one phone call to say he's doing this or doing that, man, you're fucked off. That's it. I've yeah. had guys, friends doing two or three years because girlfriends or friends or somebody said that they've carried yeah. a gun or they've done this and they ain't done yeah. fuck all. Breach of the peace, man. Yeah. It's finishing two or three years off. Yeah, yeah, it does make me feel like that. I'm very selective with who I talk to, you know what I mean? Sometimes it makes me feel like I can't be myself with people and open yeah. and have as much fun mm-hmm. as, as I could be having. I've got to be reserved because I've got this thing hanging over my head and I'm thinking, why should I feel like that? They've made me feel, you know what I mean? Like You're still in prison? Yeah, like I'm still in prison and, 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 and I'm a bad person. That's how probation make me feel like, hey, you know, like mm. I'm a bad person. You know what I mean? Like I'm a threat to society. They've got me down as high risk to the public. I'm a high risk to the public. Then I just save some public members from getting raped, but I'm a high risk to the public. You know, so you have to, to protect the public from me. Isn't it me who protected the public? Well, I don't know, but the way they look at it is kind of fucked, isn't it? So that's how they make me feel, isn't it? Like, Do you I'm think a, a racism kicks into play? Did you ever feel working through co working through the system? Um, or was that? No, I don't think so because it was a black man, isn't it? That, yeah. that, was, that died, that was the rapist. So I don't think it's the racism, but I think there is racism within the mapper. You see, they've got a thing called MAPA and then you've got like the parole board and you've got the probation service, the national probation service. I think there's institutionalized racism within that that comes out onto the, us, the clients. And I mean, the service users, they call us now. It comes out in little bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They'll try and act like they're, they're, they're giving you something, uh, uh, something decent. Like, oh yeah, yeah, I hope you're getting on well. Well, now we're here to help you. But you know, in the other hand, they just got, you know what I mean? That big dagger there waiting to stab you any given time, you know what I mean? And sometimes they do things like that behind your back, they'll write reports and put things in there that you didn't even expect to see because it's a, a, a probation officer giving their opinion on what they think's going through your head. Opinion, it's not a fact, it's just their opinion, mm-hmm. you know? And then you just have to accept it because if you don't, it's like you're challenging, isn't it? And then it, it's like, oh, well, you're not ready for society yet, you're not. You know, yeah. you're not conforming, are you? We're telling you to do this. We're giving our professional opinions and you have to go along with it. If you challenge it, then obviously there's some problem there and you're, you're a menace to society or you're, you know, yeah. high so, risk. So you're talking about you do rap now. So where can people, you've said you can, you can get your music, but have you got a new song or something coming out? Yeah, I've got a, um, a new song called Straight Out The Bottle coming out. Um, like I said, I've done it with uh, Masterpiece. Um, from the fanatics and um, shout out to my friend Bez for the hookup, my, our mutual friend. Um, you can get all my other music on YouTube, all the other platforms, Spotify, um, Apple, everything. Just type in O F I double L and it will come up. You will get me. You will see all my music and all my stuff. Mm-hmm. What about your YouTube channel? Yeah, the YouTube channel is the same thing. Just O F I double L. And it will bring you to my page. And yeah, you can see what I've done so far. So far, I've got, I think, three videos on there. So this straight out the bottle one's going to be the fourth. Um, and I believe this song here, this is the one. This is the one that's going to go off, man. This is the one that people can party to for forever, really. You know, like when we're gone, our children's children's children will still be partying to this one. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, I hope it works out. If you What's your plans with the future then? Um... Just uh, press on with the music, try and be successful, try and work with some charities in my community, you know, like for the um the young youth who this all this young knife crime and all this madness, the gang stuff that's going on. I wanna try and get involved in my community, man, and other communities and other projects and stuff like that. And hopefully my influence, you know what I mean, on the younger generation can, you know what I mean, bring some positivity, you know what I mean? Yeah. And apart from that, you know, just be successful with my music, try and build myself an independent business or something like that. Uh, I don't even know. I might even try and go into some sort of something like yourself doing, you know? Talking, mate. Yeah, yeah. talking. Because I like talking to people. I've had to do it for a long time. You know, I can get on with most people from most walks of life, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I've met a lot of different personalities that I, I can get on with and, you know, I don't mind talking, you know what I mean? And giving advice. I'm a good listener as well to people as well, you know? So... 
Yeah, yeah. The future's the future's bright. Good brother. Yeah, What's the, what was the worst pr prison you were in? Uh, it's got to be Full Sutton. How come? In Yorkshire. Just for the fact, I went from Dovegate, which was a decent, um, I think it's half B cat, half C cat. And then I went from the TC. So it's like, yeah, the ensuite shower in your cell. It's, you can be out all the time. It's kind of comfy to double A cat. <laughs> you know, like, and then you can't get out of there until you've done like a year and a half. And then obviously in there, it's just a different level of um, living to other prisons because it's, there you see some real shit, you know what I mean? That you hear about and see in movies, you know, you see people's face getting burnt off with oil and, and hot water and people getting stabbed, cells getting burnt out. You see all sorts, man, hanging their self and, you know what I mean? And in there, it can even come to you. I'm, I had a little drama in there with somebody tried to poke my eye out. <laughs> somebody from Birmingham. And this was just so, it started over music, believe it or not. You know what I mean? And then, I don't know. People just get serious in there, man. You know what I mean? What's it like to see that when people get fucking hot water, sugar thrown in their face? People it's mad. Stabbed. It fucks with your psychology because you think to yourself automatically, right, that's not happening to me. So what do I have to do to make sure that don't happen to me? So I don't want to become a recluse and stay in my soul all the time. I'm not that type of person. I'm not staying in my soul like I'm scared to come out, but I have to be more careful with who I talk to and who I banter with, because that's how it starts off in there. You know, it can start off with a simple banter and there's a man is not in the mood today. He says, shut up, don't talk to me like that, man, you dickhead. And then, but the next man's not a dickhead. Next man says, suck your mother, you talking to you pussy old man. Like, what? That's it. Yeah. Just simple as that. People being in the wrong mood. Or a man playing his music too loud at night time. Man bang the wall. Boom, boom, boom. Oi! Turn it down, I'm trying to fucking sleep. Shut up. All right, I'll see you in the morning. Mm. In the morning, doors open. Woo, 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 woo. It's going off. Yeah, simple as that. And then obviously you got people that have got their road beefs. And then it ends up in the jail because they're in the same wing of each other. Then you've got the gangs. You get me? You had the burgers, the Johnnies up there. Who are they? Burger Bar and Johnson gangs from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. um, tough lot, they back in Birmingham, a lot of the tough yeah, bastards, man. Yeah, you've got not in them gangs up there as well. Best with us day and other people, Waterfront and stuff like that. And then you got, um, so you've got the people from London, <laughs> Tottenham, Hackney, Northwest, East London, you know? It's, it goes off in there, man. You know what I mean? Manchester, Gooch, Donington and stuff like that. And yeah, some real shit in there. That's where the real bad boys are. <laughs> Did you lose any friends to suicide in there yourself? You know what? Wayland, the Joe I got out from in 2020. My next door tried to hang himself. Um, but he was a troubled soul. And... <laughs> He was on a bit of um, what he call spice. But when he was off of the spice, he was a nice brother and uh, he was a, a decent somebody to talk to. And he was only in there for something stupid. You know what I mean? But the drugs had him in a way. And then he was that type of guy, he would get really lippy with the screws and they'd just try and put him behind his door as quick as possible. But he self-harm. You know, you straight away, you could see him in it. The, cuts all down their wrists and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Even some on his neck and stuff like that. So, um, everyone on the ring got on with him. He's that type of guy. Be like, oh, do you need any favors? And rah, 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 do that and that for you. No, he's the type of guy you'd give a burn to all the time. Yeah, nice one. Come on, man, I got you, man. He's a cool guy, you know what I mean? He looked after himself, you know what I mean? He wasn't one of them people like, oh, you're, you smoke spice and you're, you're, you're a tramp or something like that. He was a decent boy, but he had his little vice, you know what I mean? And um he used to always used to ask the screws to let him out to clean. And uh, some of the screws, the SOs and that, they would let him out and then other screws wouldn't let him out. But he, need, he needed to come out, otherwise he would start trying to fucking arm himself in there. So, you know, it's certain screws that were just like seeing people in stress and in depression and willing to hurt themselves. And in, in Wayland, it was evil that they just left him and he sold pure times and he kept saying oh, I'm going to cut myself I'm going to do this and that and he actually started cutting himself up and then we tried to talk to him and then another day he tried to hang himself but the same screw that didn't want to let him out she's come opened his door 
took out her cut down knife, tried to cut him down off of his ligature, but her cut down knife's not working. Because she's probably been using it for other things like cutting boxes or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And they're never supposed to use their cut down knife for anything else because they're supposed to use it once for that one time where that ligature, you know what I mean, might be so tough it could be made out of the bedding or whatever, you know what I mean? Jeans material. It's got to go through with no hesitation. And she's there soaring at it. It's not doing nothing. I've shot him up. I've gone in there, innit? And I'm trying to hold his legs up. And my mate's trying to hold his fucking legs up. And he's gone to the screw. Give me the fucking knife. Took it off of her and just put your strength to it and that's it, popped him down and that fucking, that ruined my head, man. I thought, fuck, man. Scary, that, Yeah, it's scary, man. You know what I mean? Seeing people that you know, you know what I mean? Are friendly with, you know what I mean? Trying to kill themselves just because they can't come out of their soul and clean that. Some people do have it hard in there, man. You know? Yeah, I've seen some shit, man. How did you end up in Lad Bible? Lad Bible? I, I did um, Delinquent Nation. Shout out to SP for that. Um, I'm from Delinquent Nation. I think they noticed me from there. And then they asked me to come on. And I was like, yeah, why not? I saw their thing. I was like, yeah, why not, man? It's good for promotion. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a mad story. Like <clears throat> any man in that position, if they were to see that or hear that, any your first instincts, I'm going to kill that bastard. Because that's the worst thing ever mm. is to for any man to abuse a woman or a kid. Like, in your mm. mind, for me, like, it's the worst of the worst. Like, there's no going back from that so for you to take that man's life like that it, like I said at the start I don't really condone violence but for somebody to do that a serial fucking beast like mm -hmm. for me it's okay man like these people should be fucking hung these people should be if they're going to bring back killings and mm -hmm. hang, hangings these yeah. are the, because you get a 12 but yeah there's people out there that rape kids that get two and three years exactly where's the justice exactly where's the fucking justice exactly you know what I mean so how do you move forward from it all and kind of move on, get your music out there and just try and live the rest of your life as happy as you can be? Um, is it difficult or do you get a lot of big plans? Yeah, because obviously I think right now my plans are bigger than my pocket. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so obviously when my pocket can level up to my plans and I'm good to go, but it's not all about the money though, man. For me, I think it's just more about the determination, mm -hmm. you know, just keep going at, going at it, going at it, what I'm trying to do, you know, get my music out there. And eventually it will happen, isn't it? People say to me, trust the process. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to trust the process right now. And the process so far has brought me to yours. Like, you know what uh, I mean? To your podcast. Down, brother. Come on, man. For anybody yeah. that's watching, bro, that like, for anybody that's in prison or trying to be a bad man, like you weren't a bad man, that like, you just got caught yeah. up in some shit where that's you've got right. a life sentence. But that's what right. advice would you give for anybody? Um, just stay strong, focus. You know what I mean? If you know you've got your date to come out, that's your date to come out. Don't let no one or anything, you know what I mean? Fuck up your head and take you off of your path to go home. Just do what you got to do. Stay focused. Yeah. Educate yourself while you're in there. Go gym. Do what you can do. Yeah. Don't be a waste, man. You get me? Come out and make something of yourself. Life, life is nice out there. And there's things that can happen that People will tell you, nah, that's hard, that's hard, it'll take forever. Don't believe what anyone's got to say. Try it out for yourself. Yeah. Do your own thing. Would you like to finish up on anything else, brother? Yeah. Um, you can get me at O F I W -L, L, all platforms. Um, uh, shout out to my friend Yacht Life, shout out to MMT, shout out to Masterpiece, and everyone that's worked with me so far, Six Degree Studios. Uh, Thank you, James, for having me on. And um, yeah, that's me, Oldfield, the defender. I'm out here. Watch out. Oldfield, well, listen, God bless you, brother. All right, I thank wish you. I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, James. Good luck with your music. Respect, love. Yeah. All right.